To date, the Dialogue Without Borders has the satisfaction to receive Professor Lee Mesco. Welcome, Professor Mesco. Thank you, Professor Finori. Very nice to be here. Professor Mesco has studied first in Australia, her native country, and then in England. And she has been teaching in the United States for quite some time, first in Columbia, in New York, and now she's the head of the Center for Archaeology in Stanford, in California, in the US. And she is a specialist on several subjects, including ancient Egypt and uh, heritage. And particularly, the subject of our talk today is about UNESCO and world heritage. Mm -hmm. So, Professor Masco, um, what's the specificity of UNESCO as a or, uh, United Nations organism dealing with uh, heritage? So UNESCO actually looks after education, science, and culture. So that's the ESC part of UNESCO. And it's an intergovernmental organization. So it's made up of um, 191, I think, signatory states. And uh, they monitor and run the 1972 Convention for Protecting World Cultural and uh, Natural Heritage. And as an archaeologist, that's the convention that I'm interested in. They have other conventions that protect underwater archaeology or intangible heritage. But as archaeologists, we are we're drawn to that list of uh, world heritage sites. So uh, this was established in 1972, this kind of mm -hmm. list of uh, archaeological sites protected by or mm -hmm. listed by UNESCO. And my question is, uh, do you consider that uh, UNESCO is a confederation of states? It's not a uh, it does not include um, uh, indigenous peoples or mm. um, transnational organizations. It's a federation as the UN, That's because right. it's part of the UN system, mm -hmm. a federation of nation mm -hmm. states who are there to protect their own interests and their point, standpoints. That, so in this, in this situation, the 72 convention establishes a series of criteria mm -hmm. for uh, sites to be considered of world value. Mm -hmm. So what's your op opinion about this tension between the nation state mm -hmm. as the um, member, the party, let's say, of the convention, and then the fact that uh, you have the humanity the whole, right. as a whole? <clears throat> so you have hit upon one of the most uh, obvious tensions. As I said, it is an intergovernmental organization, and it is part of the United Nations. So it's only really nations that can put forward sites to the list. So they can only put them forward to be nominated, evaluated, and then possibly inscribed. So it always serves national or state interests. And uh, increasingly, the Secretariat of UNESCO in Paris would like to see, I think, more indigenous participation, but uh, indigenous groups, transnational groups, NGOs cannot nominate sites. They may be able to put pressure on their own governments to uh, highlight particular sites or natural landscapes, but it's really up to the state government to support that, to put the nomination dossier together uh, and to go through that process. And it's actually the 21 members of the World Heritage Committee, the 21 nations that are represented, that are the most powerful decision makers. So getting onto that committee, and Brazil was on that committee very recently, and very powerful uh, and outspoken. Th those are the real power brokers deciding uh, the future of world heritage. So that means that, uh, like the Security Council in, well, not exactly the same, mm. uh, because of the veto, but mm. anyway, uh, yes. you have some kind of committee so mm -hmm. that you can have a group of nations that are elected by others mm -hmm. to represent exactly. um, uh, areas. Uh, of the world, uh, but uh, ev even though it, this is a small, smaller number of countries, mm -hmm. anyway, it functions. The council functions still under the same principle of mm -hmm. uh, nation states, right. and um, so the challenge for archaeologists, I suppose, is the fact that our, our, we we are dealing with uh, the idea of a uh, world heritage, so mm -hmm. some kind of prehistoric site somewhere that should be interesting not only for the country right. for Peruvians or for Bolivians or for whatever, but for the humanity as a whole. Right. So, uh, for archaeologists, particularly, this is a, uh, it's challenging. So, how how you as a, as a, a, a 
student of this subject because you you are an observer you are That's observing right, observe, this, yeah. this 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 uh, the mm. setting mm. what would you say about this the tensions between archaeologists as professionals mm -hmm. with these theoretically uh, very broad uh, aims of goals of uh, defending mm -hmm. hum the humanity as a whole right. and then nation states right I think for a start, archaeologists don't really understand how UNESCO operates. I think for a very long time, we have imagined that bureaucrats in Paris made the decisions about what sites were included. We've criticized UNESCO as an organization, but of course, we're only talking about the World Heritage Center or the 1972 Convention. We don't know where to target our criticism to begin mm -hmm. with. But then gradually we are educating ourselves to see that it is the World Heritage Committee, it is the nation states that are elected, as you say, powerful countries elected onto that committee that serve a four-year term that end up deciding what will, be, what will be inscribed, but also more importantly, you know, what will be conserved, because there are 1,007 sites on the list, many of them very monumental sites, uh, not many, I think, in comparison what we would consider regular archaeological sites. Uh, so there's been a preference for monumental um, properties like the pyramids or the Acropolis, Machu Picchu. Pompeii, very, Machu exactly, Picchu. So very, exactly, very large iconic, sites. I iconic sites. So that's been um, a priority. But what's happening, I think, for archeo that archaeologists need to be aware of is that the conservation of those sites needs to have more attention because the, the convention was supposed to be about conservation. You know, think back to early issues like Abu Simbel, the earthquake in Cuzco, the floods in Venice. It was about conservation, which is what archaeologists are also concerned about. Now it's become about countries wanting to inscribe, to list, to brand more and more the competition between does Italy have the most sites, China is the second most sites, uh, are there more European sites than um, sites in Latin America, Africa, or Asia? So that there's a, a competition going on about inscription, not preservation, conservation, and management, which is, I think, why archaeologists need to, to be more educated about those processes. It was probably much simpler in 72, after, in the wake of this uh, Aswan yes. uh, bridge, uh, bridge um, the dam, uh, dam mm -hmm. in Egypt. So there was this international effort by several countries, uh, including yes. uh, the so the communist countries yes, at that period. Right. So there was a kind of international, it was easy to have this as a common project right. a, in benefit of the humanity. Today, it's a more mixed mm -hmm. situation because mm -hmm. you have these na uh, not only national interests, but also um, what I would call sub-imperialism. So I, mm -hmm. my next mm -hmm. question is about this, the fact that you have, uh, the traditional lead was controlled, the UNESCO was controlled by uh, let's let's say the Western states, but mm -hmm. also Soviet Union. So it was a kind of um, uh, it was a stable world. After the, after and uh, the, the the end of the Cold, Cold War, War. Mm. Uh, you have this uh, other countries, um, mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the BRICS and yes. China, but uh, main countries like Brazil, South yes. Africa. So I would like to ask you about this this new situation right. that you should comment before. Mm -hmm, during mm -hmm. the Cold War and then the changes we are witnessing. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, if you look at the beginnings of UNESCO, it's very much, uh, and this is a larger organization, not just the cultural arm, it's very much shaped by French, British, American, even to some degree Australian uh, visions of what a utopian organization of world government um, should look like. And it was very much a dream of peace and changing the minds of men to create peaceful situations. You know, that's the, the, the real motto. But in 72, after the wake of Abu Simbel and these cooperative um, efforts, the idea was to preserve a list of what is sometimes called the best of the best. Mm. Now, we can be very critical of what that means mm. in what culture, but in the early days, in, in the, the late 70s, um, the pyramids were inscribed, the Acropolis is inscribed, and, and often it's uh, one, one piece of paper that there's the entire nomination dossier, or it will just say, you know, the Acropolis should be inscribed. Nowadays, countries spend millions of dollars 
Mm. Um, I looked at the Rio uh, Carioca landscape nomination dossier. It's many hundreds and hundreds of pages. It must have been very expensive pr to produce. It's very well researched, very well argued. So that's really changed. Much and more professional. It's much more professional, much more detailed, much more bureaucratic. Um, but you're right that the first signatories and the dominant nations in the early stages were, of course, Western European. And I think it's important when we say Europe, we actually mean Western Europe and Mediterranean Europe. This is not to pretend that Scandinavia or Eastern mm. Europe were dominating. Mm -hmm. It's very particular countries. And I think, you know, you think of France, Italy, Germany, Spain, that's a good start, mm. all right? In terms of nominations, numbers of inscriptions, but then in later, in later decades, the late 80s and 90s, you start to see the rise of Southeast Asian countries, uh, Asia in general, ratifying the convention, then for putting sites forward. Um, some early countries there, Thailand, Cambodia, um, China becomes very active. And then you get partnerships uh, after the Cold War to uh, Russia, South Africa, as you mentioned, Brazil, the BRICS. Uh, so BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, these newly emergent economies that packed together, that vote together, not just in the World Heritage Meetings, but whether it's about climate change, nuclear proliferation, these guys, they have a development bank together, they're very powerful, and some of the issues are very similar. So I see some, um, some similarities also here in Brazil with the issues facing countries like India and South Africa. So they're tired of a certain Eurocentric domination to world heritage, and they, they really do have a point that it must be more inclusive, it must be more international, there must be greater balance. So it's a very interesting and political time. Yeah, uh, the challenge is the, just lead, as you said, that if you have 1,007 1, uh, monuments, and then you have 200 countries, that means five per country. But <coughs> if you have Italy, that's the right. most most sites, much more. Yeah, and course. then it's, that means that you have small number for other right. uh, other countries. And But uh, I, I was mentioning sub-imperialism because um, if you have the champions, let's say, you have the champions in each country, not in each area. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Brazil, for example. Mm -hmm. So Brazil represents an area, but mm -hmm. uh, it's difficult to know uh, what kind of representation could be if you consider the diversity in Right, the area. so there's many ways in which countries can align with each other. And I have done some studies of this with um, some economists who are also interested in, in how countries form alliances. So certainly regional alliances are important. And so when Brazil was on the committee, it was very supportive of other Latin American countries, Central America, and also the BRICS group. So they would all speak together and have the same opinion. However, some of our studies have shown that uh, there are different variables for how, how diverse countries might um, vote together, as it were, uh, decision-making. It's not always on things like common language or common religion. The most, the most promising or the most uh, effective union is trade relationships. Mm. So, so, it's, so it's actually, it's different from what we might imagine. counterintuitive. Yes, yes. Yeah. We might say Span the Spanish-speaking world all support each other on this, or mm. the Middle Eastern bloc, or, but in fact, it's actually about trading relationships. The Panama Canal is a good example. Panama had very good support for um, one property from Qatar mm. and South Africa. And you think, well, what might be the relationship there? Well, it's actually trade. It's yeah. about the Panama Canal. It's yeah. really not about the archaeological site. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I would like to thank you so much, Professor Mesco, for coming to our program. I'm sure that the uh, people who are watching us are learning, learned a lot about the subject, and we're also inspired to continue to follow the subject mm -hmm. and to read your papers and, and production about the UNESCO and World Heritage. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, I use this opportunity to remember everybody that uh, all the programs of the RTV, including this one, the Dialogue Without Frontier, are available at our website, RTV, at Unicamp, or otherwise also at uh, YouTube, uh, RTV at YouTube. And with this, I invite you to the next issue of our program. <laughs>